Ladies and gentlemen, welcome. Sorry, we're six minutes uh, late, but we've got the computers um, switched around. My name is Arna Moores, and I am your moderator for this evening. And my first task is to welcome Professor John Driver, who is the Vice President, President Academic of Simon Fraser University and the Provost, who has agreed to actually open up the proceedings. So please, Professor Driver. Thanks very much. Uh, welcome to Simon Fraser University and specifically to our Vancouver campus, which the Vancouver Sun called the intellectual heart of the city in a very kind uh, piece about this campus. So I probably don't have to remind all the intellectuals in the audience to turn off their cell phones before we uh, go any further. Um, it's, it's a real pleasure to welcome uh, a diverse uh, audience uh, of uh, both SFU uh, community, but also the broader community to any of our public lectures. But I'm uh, particularly pleased to introduce uh, the lecture series that we're starting tonight, um, really for two reasons. Firstly, I think it's very important that universities support the generation and the transmission of knowledge about the critical issues of today, and especially those issues where so much of the public debate is underpinned by ideology rather than by evidence. Uh, whether or not climate change is occurring, what might cause climate change, what the impacts of climate change might be, whether or not human behavior can or should be modified to mitigate the impact of climate change are all hotly debated topics um, by many groups whose ability to engage in discussion about cause and effect and consequences is sometimes compromised by ideology. And so I think it's the responsibility of universities to encourage debate and dialogue to examine the sociology of those debates critically uh, and to be a champion for evidence-based understanding and decision-making. And I'm pleased that SFU is part of this uh, public discourse and public process through activities such as this lecture series. The second reason I'm very glad to be introducing this particular series of lectures uh, is that I have uh, some personal interest uh, in it that, that goes beyond simply my, my general uh, belief that universities should uh, engage the public very closely. My own research field is archaeology, uh, and some of my own research has looked at evidence for environmental change in the past and at the impact of human uh, populations uh, on the environments uh, in which they live. Uh, I certainly share the opinion of our speakers uh, who will be coming here over the next uh, couple of months that the past provides information that's valuable to understanding the present whether this be understanding what would happen when a large earthquake hits our coast uh, or examining biodiversity in deep time. Um, at the same time, I suspect that many people in this room share my fascination, really, for our ability to, to glimpse worlds that once existed on, on our planet uh, and the fascination of predicting what might, ha what might happen in the future. The speakers list in this series includes uh, eminent uh, researchers from a wide range of disciplines. Uh, so I'd particularly like to thank the sponsors of the lecture series and the, organize, uh, the, the organizers of the, uh, of the series for building such, such a varied set of lectures around this common theme of climatic and environmental change. So thank you for coming. I do hope you'll try to get to as many of these lectures as possible. I think it's going to be a wonderful series. I think it's going to make us think uh, hard and long uh, about environmental change, about climate change, and about the potential impact uh, of, of these changes uh, on our own future. So I'll now um, turn the podium back to Arne Moores to introduce this evening's speaker. Thanks very much. Professor Driver, I think, introduced the series um, uh, succinctly and eloquently. We're very proud to, there it goes. So we have an issue, um, Houston, here. So I don't know what we have to do about that, but. Um, so I, I wanted to sh just show you why I had that slide, was to show you who is coming. Um, this is, first of all, uh, I, I do recognize some faces, and um, it's very nice to see people who've come out. This is kind of the third in a series of Something, Something, and You. Um, this one is, I think, the strangest, because it really is trying to put together uh, um, pieces of a puzzle that aren't often put together for the public, and that is trying to link paleoecology with what's happening now. And we're going to start a long time ago, 56 million years ago, and our first speaker, there are the names of everybody there, yes, um, 
is Dr. Scott Wing, who's been at the Smithsonian, he tells me, for almost 30 years. Now, the Smithsonian is one of the preeminent uh, natural history museums, general uh, science museums, um, institutions in the world. Um, he is a head curator there. He's been there for 30 years. Before that, he was with the uh, US Geology um, Service for a little while. He did both his, both his degrees uh, at Yale University. Um, and he hails from the South. And he was one of the early, one of the first people to really start to recognize and start to study a very important uh, phenomenon that I hadn't heard of before I met Scott, and I, you probably have, but I hadn't, um, and that is a, glo a, a global warming period that occurred 56 million years ago. And the title of his talk, um, I can't wait to see how he's going to do it. <laughs> Global warming 56 million years ago and what it means for us. So please join me in wel welcoming uh, for Scott Wing. So the title is, is ambitious. Um, I'm going to start in the present and then I'm going to dive back and I hope take you with me into uh, this period of time 56 million years ago, and then uh, we'll resurface at the end of the talk and release you back out into the present day. I hope, uh, having been convinced that the past actually is important in understanding the present and the future. So this is a, a graph that's probably familiar to a lot of you, showing uh, increase since uh, 1860 in carbon dioxide, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. This part of the curve uh, way back here is measured in ice cores. Um, the part of the curve starting in 1958, I believe, is measured directly from the atmosphere. And uh, it goes off into the future, um, showing various scenarios from uh, an earlier IPCC report on what might happen to CO2 uh, over the next uh, 90 years or so. And it also shows temperature records for the same time period and the temperature projections in red that correspond to these different uh, scenarios for what might happen with CO2 production. So when you look at a graph like this, you know, if you're a simple-minded uh, paleontologist like I am, you think, wow, you know, we're, this is uh, unprecedented in the last uh, 150 years or so. so if we wanted to understand what's coming down the pike a little bit better, we probably should add some more history on the back of that. So I'm just going to squeeze that record off to the side now. And now we're, now we're looking at more time. Uh, we're going back 800,000 years. And this record comes from ice cores in Antarctica. And it also shows the same two things. It shows temperature and CO2. And you can see this very characteristic sort of seesaw pattern here. Those are glacial and interglacial cycles over the last 800,000 years. And you can also see that CO2 has been going up and down, more or less uh, tracking uh, the changes in temperature. And now we, we start to get a little bit longer perspective on the changes that are likely to happen. I've left this bar much wider than it should be. I think it's about a uh, hundred times wider than it should be, the 1850 to, to 2100 period. Um, and these are projections. Uh, this is where we were in 2009 for temperature and for CO2. And these are the, the projections from that range of projections, the sort of three swooping lines that I had uh, for CO2 for the year 2100 and te uh, global temperature increase for the year 2100. So, when you see this, and you, <clears throat> unfortunately, you're still a simple-minded paleontologist, you think, oh, well, maybe we better add some more history onto the back of that graph. So let's do that. And now we're looking at the last uh, 65 million years. And there's no ice old enough to carry a record of temperature or the composition of the atmosphere that goes back 65 million years. So now the records, instead of coming from ice, are coming from uh, mostly this very continuous records coming from uh, deep, deep sea cores, uh, cores like this, from which are extracted tiny shells of marine organisms called foraminifera. And 
the chemistry of their shells allows you to reconstruct the temperature of the bottom of the ocean, which is a pretty good proxy for the temperature of the planet. And now we actually are far enough back so that we have some, some temperatures and some probable CO2 levels. You can see that we really don't know CO2 levels very well for these times. We don't have any direct way to measure it. Um, but if you, need, if you want to go um, to conditions that are something like the conditions that, we're, that our grandchildren or our great-grandchildren will experience in 90 years, you have to go back about 35 million years. So this is, this is seriously uh, back to the future or onward to the past or, or something like that. It's, that it's, it is, has been a very long time. And it's really sobering to think about the rate of this change because I was, uh, you know, on this graph, I was born in the, in the Pleistocene up here, but, uh, you know, I'm now sort of uh, getting into the, into the Pliocene or Miocene, and my great-grandchildren will be living in the Oligocene or the Eocene. So there's, there's, there's in just a few human lifetimes, we're going to, to change conditions in the atmosphere uh, to a state that hasn't been seen in 35 million years. So let's, let's go back here and examine this a little bit more, this period of time. And I'm going to focus in particularly on this little short blip here. Um, but first, I want to reassure you that, we're, that I'm not talking about an Earth that is so radically different from the present day Earth that you wouldn't recognize it. So a lot of times um, when I'm speaking with people about this uh, distant period of global warming, the first thing they say, well, you know, continents move around, so aren't all of your records sort of from different places than, than you might think? And it's not that far back. So North America, so, you know, the, the globe looks moderately familiar. Um, continents are, are more or less in the same positions, but there are some really significant differences between that time and, and our own. And, um, the biggest one is just that the climate state is entirely different. So this is a, um, a photograph taken on Axel Heiberg Island in the Canadian Arctic. And this giant black thing here and these other ones back in here are stumps of Don Redwoods growing in that area. And this is the current day vegetation of that part of the world. Um, and this forest has been studied really uh, in great detail, and it's thought to have had the productivity approximately of a forest uh, in this part of the world today. So uh, the Canadian Arctic was obviously a very different place. And this is just to emphasize that in the Eocene, the poles were much, much warmer than they are today. Um, and this sort of is a nice way of uh, visualizing that. Uh, this gentleman is uh, holding up a photograph of Okefenokee Swamp, which is probably not a terrible analog for what uh, it would have been like where he's standing right now, uh, say, 50 million years ago. The other big thing that's different between the Eocene climate and the present day climate is that the continental interiors were warm in the winter. So today, uh, we see continental interiors at mid-latitudes cool down very dramatically in the winter. Land doesn't have a lot of, of uh, thermal inertia, so it loses heat to space, and you get bitterly cold winters. But in the Eocene, uh, you had giant palms and crocodiles and all sorts of things in Wyoming at a latitude of about 45 or 50 degrees north. And that's obviously not true today. Here's the companion trying to uh, do the same thing that you saw in the previous photograph uh, of me uh, holding a picture of an alligator from Okefenokee in a, in a wintry Wyoming landscape and uh, suffering. The, but my fingers got really cold. It was about minus 20 when this picture was taken. It was in February, and I swore I would never go back to Wyoming in the winter again. I work there every summer. Uh, I've worked there every summer for about 40 years, but not in the winter for good reason. Um, so now what we're going to, so, so the, the, 
we had this long period where we don't really even understand the background state of the Earth's climate. Warm poles, warm continental interiors in the winter, they don't really make a lot of sense by modern standards. And even just understanding that much about the climate history of, uh, of the Earth is, is a significant thing. There are things that we don't understand. There are processes that we don't have a good handle on, um, even at this very broad level. But I'm going to focus on this sh very short period of time. It's called the Paleocene-Eocene Thermal Maximum. I'm going to call it PETM because I'm from Washington and I like acronyms. And, uh, the, and it, but it's called that for a very simple reason that it's at the end of the Paleocene and beginning of the Eocene. And when I, this is, the next slide is, I'm just going to blow this up. So this is, you know, this is still tens of millions of years on the, on the x-axis of this slide. Now I've blown it up so we're marked off in much finer increments with 100,000 years between the numbers there. And these are, these are records from a deep sea core uh, and they show the chemistry of um, those foram shells. And what this, is, this white line is giving you is the ratio of light carbon to heavy carbon. Uh, so there are two stable isotopes of carbon, uh, carbon-12 and carbon-13. And most biology really prefers to work with carbon-12. Carbon-12 is lighter. It's more reactive. So uh, organisms tend to concentrate carbon-12 in their tissues. And um, what this is telling us is this event, this, this big excursion here, this shift in carbon isotope ratio, uh, is telling us that there's much more carbon-12 being released into the environment and incorporated um, by organisms into their shells over this period of time. And <clears throat> this is a slide that's now a little bit out of date. It's got 55.8, and I apologize. It should be 56. You have to be really careful about our, our decimal places in the millions of years now. Didn't used to have to worry about that, but we're getting better at telling time. Um, and this red line is... Uh, is temperature as assessed from the oxygen isotope chemistry. So again, two stable isotopes, oxygen 18 and oxygen 16, and the ratio between them is controlled by the temperature at which those little shells are, are formed. So um, a lot of warming, uh, a big warming pulse, coincident with a change in what kind of carbon is available to these, to these organisms. At the very same moment in Earth history that you see that, that shift in the chemistry of carbon and that warming, um, you also see uh, over many, many cores in many parts of the, of the ocean, you see a dissolution of carbonate. So what you're seeing here is you're seeing pieces of core from one of those uh, ocean drilling ships. And you, you read these from uh, the far end to the end that's close to you. you can, uh, there are blue caps on, on the ends, on the up ends of every section of core. You have to be really careful about that when you're, when you're uh, drilling one of these, that you don't invert a piece of core. So different colored caps. Um, so older to younger, and then start here again. This would have been on top here. So older to younger, older to younger. We're coming up through the last part of the Paleocene. We get to here, and just when that chem those chemical changes occur, there's... Um, a bunch of red clay. And it's red because there's iron in it, and it's clay because there's no carbonate being deposited at the bottom of the ocean. So something is dissolving the limestone or the chalk, really, um, that should have been being deposited at the bottom of the ocean. We can take that, th these four primary pieces of evidence, global warming, which turns out to be about four to eight degrees Celsius, the dissolution of deep ocean chalk in um, many, many places now measured uh, in, in the deep ocean. This carbon isotope ratio that changes by about, about five parts per thousand. And uh, also the observation that this event lasts for about 200,000 years. So it lasts for, starts at 56 million and lasts uh, for about 200,000 years. And the conclusion that you can reach from these pieces of evidence is that there was the release of a really huge amount of, of carbon. Um, and it's estimated to be somewhere between 4,000 and 7,000 billion tons of carbon. 
um, that was released probably in a period of just a few millennia. That's actually something that we're still working on, um, trying to figure out exactly how long the onset of this event is. But uh, it appears to be several thousand years um, at least, and, but probably not a lot more than that. How much carbon is that? Uh, it is about the size of the entire fossil fuel reservoir. So if you took all of the fossil fuels that we know of and you burned all of them, that's about in the ballpark of how much carbon would be released. By now, I expect that you're wondering where the carbon came from. You're thinking, I know that there were no power plants 56 million years ago. Where did the carbon come from? And that's, that is embarrassingly, it is the, the, of course, it's the first and most obvious question that you would ask when you, when you first detect an event like this, and 20 years after it's being detected, we still aren't 100% sure of the answer. Um, but there are a lot of live hypotheses, um, and they include uh, probably most, uh, the most favored at this point is that methane hydrates, which are sort of ice-like compounds, they're known uh, to be preserved in many places on the, in the ocean floor today. Um, these are, the methane is actually released by uh, microbes that are decaying organic matter in the ocean floor. And because the temperature in, is low and the pressure is high, they, they don't escape to the surface. The methane doesn't escape to the surface. It gets kind of trapped in an, in a, in an ice cage and ends up being sort of, bi and just basically building up in the, in the sediment at the bottom of the ocean. You can actually light these on fire. Another possibility is that there could have been extensive wildfires. There's actually not enough biomass in terrestrial vegetation to explain uh, that amount of carbon. So you have to assume that if it was all coming from wildfire, that the, the wildfires were also burning peat deposits. So this is a photograph of Indonesian peat deposits burning uh, during an El Nino year. Uh, it's also been proposed that the North Atlantic was in a very active phase of volcanism off of, uh, off of Scandinavia at this time, and that perhaps um, there were volcanic intrusions into organic rich uh, sediments that uh, basically cooked methane and CO2 out of those sediments and sent, sent it into the atmosphere. And it's also been suggested that permafrost was oxidizing uh, and giving up very large amounts of carbon. Um, all of these are, uh, sources are coming from, the, the carbon would be coming from uh, organic matter that had been cycled through organisms and therefore it would have a lot of carbon-12 in it. So this, this is, all of these are reasonable explanations and of course there's no reason why more than one of them might not have been involved. So I've been mentioning this is, a, this is an event that's now been detected globally and this this actually may not include the very latest uh, sections where the PETM has been studied, but there are lots of cores now where uh, this is, all the white circles are, are marine sections, so places where uh, it's been recorded uh, what's going on in the ocean, and the, the uh, red stars are terrestrial. Many fewer places where it's been studied uh, on land uh, or in sections that were deposited on land. Uh, but that's really what I'm interested in, and that's what we're going to focus on. And we're going to go uh, to a place called the Bighorn Basin in Wyoming, here between the Bighorn Mountains and the main uh, front of the Rockies. And it looks like this. And in, there are the Bighorn Mountains. And 56 million years ago, those mountains were being pushed up, and the mountains on the other side were being pushed up. And they were being eroded away as they were being pushed up and they were depositing sediment in rivers that flowed down into this basin and the basin was subsiding. So a very wonderful place to trap sediment and fossils uh, at exactly this time. And these giant red stripes that you see here are fossil soil horizons. So the, the river would come in, would deposit some mud and then soils would start to form and then uh, another flood and the soils would sort of grow up through the freshly deposited soil and that kept happening and happening and happening. Um, and there's about a kilometer thick of rock that represents a couple million year period on either side and about 40 meters of it represents the PETM. 
So what do I do when I go out there? Something that, that people sometimes ask me. Uh, I wander around in the Badlands with a shovel uh, for days and days and days. And uh, I was talking with, with Arna on the way here, and, and he was trying to find out uh, what I had been doing for my career. And I said, well, I've, I've really only ever done one thing that was very interesting, uh, which is to find plant fossils during this Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. And, and, uh, and the way I did that was by just not stopping. And, and so I, I, I did, it is true that I spent about 15 years wandering around in these badlands with a shovel uh, looking for fossils of this period of time and not finding them. But eventually, uh, in the, I guess it was the 15th year, I actually did find them. And, that was, that was, and, and when I did find them, I was with one other person who was, had never been to the field before and had no idea what we were doing. And it was his first day ever in the field. And it was 4 o'clock in the afternoon. And it was about 100 degrees. And, and I had forgotten our lunches and left them in the car. And he was out of water. And, and we were coming over this hill, and I was just poking around with my shovel like that, and out popped this fossil. And the second I saw it, I knew that we had finally found the fossils that I was looking for. So of course, of course I started to cry <laughs> and, I, and laugh and cry. And, and I was digging and laughing and crying <laughs> when it occurred to me that, that I had somebody with me. And, and I looked up, and he was looking really horrified because he, he, had, he had no idea where the car was. He was out of water. It was really hot. And the guy he was with had just gone mad. So anyway, um, th this, is, this represents a very large amount of activity in uh, much of my life. Um, and, but, it, but sometimes you find things, uh, and then you, you dig a little bit bigger hole, sometimes finding pieces of plants. And if the hole has fossils in it, you dig even bigger holes, and sometimes even bigger holes than that. This is my favorite hole in the ground because you can see it on Google Earth if you know exactly which year to look at. There's a little, there's a little dot there that you can see from space where we dug holes with, with our shovels and picks. Uh, and there are beautiful plant fossils that come out of those holes. And so we, uh, we wrap them up with the latest in high-tech uh, wrapping material, um, very valuable stuff, and then create them and take them back to the museum. And then I get to play with them all winter, looking at them and, and trying to figure out what they are and how many types there are. And over a very long period of time, I've been able to put together a record that doesn't just include the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, but also includes about um, 7 million years so that with the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum right in the middle. And a bunch of, the, of them are sort of scattered around on this map. So this, this is just to give you a sense of what sampling is like across this period of time that, that allows us to reconstruct the changes in, in floras that happened during this time period. And all I've done here is just stack up these, these crosses. So each cross represents one fossil leaf site. And there are about 220 of them or something like that. Um, all together, and uh, they're placed along the time axis here, just to give you a sense. So they're, they're a lot between about 57 million and about 55 million years ago, and that's, that's quite intentional so that we can catch what's happening through the PETM. And now I'm going to blow that up, and uh, you'll see that, that uh, it looks a lot less good when you start ticking off time in 100,000-year in increments. Um, but we still have a fair number of samples from within the PETM and a good grouping before and a good grouping after. So this gives us the opportunity to, to document uh, changes in, in the composition of, uh, of the vegetation uh, through that time period. And this is uh, a representation of that change. Um, it's a kind of chart that, that uh, paleontologists love to look at. Um, and it's actually not that bad. Um, so time is going left to right here, older to younger. And each of these green lines just represents the, the, uh, 
the stratigraphic range of a, or the temporal range of a plant species. So it starts with a, with a, the, the, these dots represent places where it's actually been sampled, and um, sometimes you know, you'll have a, <clears throat> you'll have a species that that goes along and it just it quits and you don't see it anymore. So it, it's either locally or globally extinct at that point. Um, and you can divide the range, these ranges up by kind of by eye, really, um, into um, a set of plants that species that look like they quite possibly went extinct um, right either right at or right before the PETM began. Um, we often don't pick up the last record of a species, so it's not surprising that they don't all go right up to the, to the bottom. Um, another group of species that show up during the PETM, but they're actually not present before or afterwards. So these are, appear to be immigrants. Another group of species that show up after the event is over. Um, so those are, those are immigrants, but not PETM immigrants. They're actually Eocene immigrants. And then a whole bunch of species, uh, which I call local extirpation. So these are not extinctions, per se, uh, associated with the PETM, but they it's very suspicious that they have nice records before and nice records after the event is over, but we don't find them in any of the sites that we have um, that were deposited during the PETM itself. So they, it appears that their populations are wiped out. And the color scheme here, blue, orange, green, purple, you'll see in the next few slides, because I'm just going to show you a few pictures to give you a sense of what these, of what these plants look like. Um, so here's some of the possible um, extinguished uh, plant species. Uh, two things, both in the dogwood group, the larger group of dogwoods. So this is, and this is actually kind of, it gives us a sense, knowing what they are or even knowing about what they are, um, helps us uh, interpret these changes. So these are, these are examples of taxa that go extinct, of species that go extinct, and they belong to a group of plants that uh, today is pretty common in the temperate zone. Here's a, a rogues gallery of the, the immigrants. And many, many of them are, uh, belong to the bean family. This is a family that is often associated in the modern world with tropical dry climates. And uh, so here they are um, showing up as immigrants during this period of, of uh, warm climate 56 million years ago. And then these are plants that, that come in afterwards, the green code for, for immigrants that come in after the, the, uh, the PETM is over. And they include uh, this climbing fern, which is actually a genus that's found today in temperate areas, a member of the linden family, an alder, and a member of the hickory family. So again, temperate plants. And uh, the locally extirpated taxa uh, also appear to be mostly temperate plants. So uh, a member of the oak family, birch family, a couple of kinds of sycamores, uh, katsura tree, uh, dawn redwood, and ginkgo, all being examples of plants that are common before the event happens, they're common after the event happens, but they're nowhere to be seen, in Wyoming at least, during the PETM itself. So what does that imply about, about plant ranges? Um, I think what it, the most reasonable interpretation of that, and, and we, don't, we can't prove this yet because we don't have sites in other places. That's something I'm uh, preparing to spend another 15 years looking for somewhere else in the world. Um, but I think what's going on is that when, the, when climate warms, when global climate warms, uh, basically plants are pushing north on each of the continents. Um, during the very warmest part of... Um, of the event, um, they're probably moving around these high latitude land bridges, which you know we these are poorly uh, constrained. We don't really know exactly how much uh, land and, and sea there is up here uh, on these paleogeographic reconstructions. But some of the species that we find in the earliest part of the Eocene after the event clearly are coming. We have records of them, earlier records of them in Europe or in Asia. So we know that that plants are getting around uh, the Arctic during the warmest part of this event. And then, of course, at the end of the event, it cools down again, and 
the plants are moving south on, on their respective continents. So they once again get more isolation of the warm climate floras onto different land masses. So this is kind of the, the, the take home, if you will, about what happens to, to floras in Wyoming. Uh, during the onset, you get massive uh, local or regional extirpation of these temperate deciduous plants, things like dawn redwood, birches, sycamores, etc. And very quickly, in fact, the, the earliest uh, samples we have in the PTM can, are dominated by uh, subtropical or, or dry tropical plants, uh, especially those in the bean family. And then 150,000 years later, um, the process is reversed. You change, you shift the, the climate back towards, um, towards a somewhat cooler state, um, and you get local or regional extirpation of those dry tropical guys who had come in at the beginning of the event, and um, the return of most of the natives, if you will, um, plus some intercontinental migrants who came across the high latitudes, um, and you get a minor amount of extinction. It's about 10% of the lineages that don't make it through. It's actually not inconsiderable, but 10% 10, 10 is, as geologists uh, track things, is not, not huge. This is not a, a, one of the major mass extinctions. And just to give you a sense of what that might look like, uh, we, we can start our, our three-second tour of the PETM. This is the Paleocene with the ginkgos and um, bald cypress trees, and sort of scan across. Oop, there went the PETM uh, with its beans and uh, then here we are back in the Eocene uh, with swamp floras and relatively uh, milder conditions again. So what else happens during this event? We have, we have a, you can see a really uh, very substantial but transitory change in the flora. Um, what happens with other, other uh, parts of the biota? Well, one thing that happens is that uh, there's a very dramatic uptick in the uh, feeding frequency of insects on plants. And uh, in case you're wondering what you're looking at here, you're looking at a couple of fossil leaves. And this is a bug bite. It's a fossil bug bite. I have a colleague who studies, his entire career is studying fossil bug bites. <laughs> And we love him for it. <laughs> he knows more about bug bites than any human, other human on the planet. And you can, find, you can do amazing things. So, so a, we had a student who, um, who tabulated uh, the diversity and prevalence of bug bites on fossil leaves. And uh, th this, is, this is like scar tissue, basically. If, if, um, if, the, if something if a worm plowed through this leaf after it was deposited, it wouldn't have reacted because it would have been a dead leaf. Uh, so the fact that there's scar tissue there lets you know that it was eaten by an insect while it was on the tree. So we see this, this nearly you know, 30 40% increase, maybe more than that, in the frequency of bug bites and also in the diversity of bug bites during the PTM. So insects were feeding more actively on plants. and this has actually been, it's been observed in greenhouse experiments of living plants that if you put plants in a high CO2 environment, they actually make less uh, photosynthetic pigment or photosynthetic protein and their nutritive value is lower and herbivorous organisms have to kind of compensate by eating more. So this, this actually is kind of in accord with, with some uh, experimental um, work that's been done on living plants. Higher up the food chain, uh, there are also big changes in, in the uh, mammalian fauna and uh, other kinds of vertebrates that go along with this event. So um, the very first record of odd-toed ungulates, the horses and their relatives, uh, this critter called Hyracotherium, it shows up um, right at the onset of the, of the PETM. So do the earliest even-toed ungulates, the relatives of ancestors or earliest relatives of pigs and sheep and deer, and so to the earliest primates, our, our own order. So there's a, there's, these guys all show up in North America at the beginning of the PETM. We don't really know where they come from, uh, possibly from Asia, but it's not, it's not known yet. But obviously, 
the ranges of plants and animals are changing. Um, there's another really curious thing, uh, which is that there's a dramatic change in body size. So this is one of these little horses. This is actually a big one. Um, so the, here's a horse, and oh, that's in inches. I'm sorry. Oh, well. Uh, <laughs> yeah. What? What? <laughs> It's uh, maybe, not, maybe a meter, not quite a meter. No, it's not a meter. Anyway, uh, I won't try to do the conversion in my head. I apologize for my, for my country's uh, ignorance of, of metric system. Um, well, I used meters on this. I, see that. I didn't take that picture. So, <laughs> um, so, so, so all the horses are small, but this is a graph of, of how big the horses are based on their teeth. And the first ones show up here right at the beginning. This is the beginning of the PETM. The first ones show up, and they promptly start to shrink. And they shrink by about 30%. And then they get very small. They're now, when you get up into here, the, the, some of them are the size of Siamese cats. I mean, they're really tiny horses. And then at the end of the event, they increase in size by about 75%. They get, kind of go back to being, actually, they're a little bigger than they were when they came in. And uh, so it appears to be a rapid evolutionary change in body size. Um, the best guess is this may also be related to, uh, to changes in the, in the nutritiveness of, of um, the food that they're eating. And it actually happens to a lot of other lineages. A lot of the mammalian uh, lines that go across this event uh, have experienced a dwarfing during the event itself. So what are the lessons? Um, I, I promised I would give you lessons from, from the PETM. Um, well, the, the first and, and most significant lesson is that, that if, um, if anybody tells you that a big release of carbon into the atmosphere doesn't do anything, we, 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 you can say, yeah, it's happened before, and it does do something. And what it does is it raises the temperature of the planet, and it dissolves a lot of chalk in the ocean. Eventually, it dissolves a lot of chalk, but it increases the it, it, de it, it makes the ocean more acid, which is why that chalk dissolves. Um, another factor, um, we, it, another th lesson from this event is that there probably are self-reinforcing cycles within the Earth system that we're just beginning to understand. <clears throat> but um, increasingly, the more we work on this event, uh, I told you that there are four different potential sources, and it's beginning to look more and more as if there's more than one of those sources involved. So you can, at this point, imagine, and I hope in the next few years we'll be able to test the idea that, that some, some factor uh, trips off release of, of CO2 and or methane into the atmosphere and warms it. And that that warmed atmosphere then warms the ocean, and it also results in rainfall on the continents that's more intermittent. So that warm atmosphere is more active, uh, it's also hotter, and rain falls and rain's heavy, vegetation grows, but then you, you go through longer periods of time where um, it's dry, and so the biomass can burn. So intermittent rainfall um, and a warmer ocean can lead to, on the, in the case of intermittent rainfall, to more wildfires, which produce CO2, which causes the atmosphere to warm, or in the case of a warmer ocean, leads to dissociation of these methane deposits in the ocean floor, which generates methane, which also warms the atmosphere. So you get these vicious cycles of starting with one release and ending with others. And if you're thinking of um, what might happen in the future, you should be. A third possibility, or third lesson, really, is that, that rapid global warming obviously changes where plants and animals live, and um, also it changes how they interact. And it even drives uh, rapid evolution in body size in mammals. Finally, and it's, it's sort of the most obvious thing if you're working on this event, but we sometimes forget to communicate it to people, the effects last for 200,000 years. So this is, this is a, it, it's a global shift which to a geologist looks like a transient change, like a perturbation, like a blip. But to any sane human, it's forever. Right? 
nobody worries about what's going to happen in 200,000 years. It just isn't on to think about that. We, can't, we have trouble thinking four years ahead in the US, so this is, this is <laughs> slightly more than four years. So that's, so, so that's your tour of, of, of deep time, but now I want to, to sort of um, bring you back and maybe give you a little um, more sense of, of, you know, sort of not, not what are the science lessons, but what, is it, what does this mean? What does it mean to me? What, is, what should it mean to you? Um, I, I once gave somebody who was visiting the museum a sort of song and dance on the, on the PTM and my research and other people's research. Um, and they said, yeah, but what, you know, why should I care about that? And I said, well, you know, thousands of years from now, and they, they, sort of, they said, you're trying to tell me that I should be worried about what happens in thousands of years. And I said, yeah, that's not very long. <laughs> And you know, they sort of looked at me like the appropriately kooky museum curator and said, well, good luck with that. You know, and that, that was the end of that conversation. So, so I, what, I, what I'm now going to try to do is, tell you, is to persuade you not only that there are lessons from deep time, but that it actually should matter at some sort of gut level. Um, and to do that, I want to just talk a little bit about this, this idea or a concept called the Anthropocene. And you might have seen that go by on a slide at the beginning. Um, and so that's what the, the rest of this is kind of directed at. Uh, and it's not really a science talk anymore. This is, this is kind of more, more on the touchy-feely side. So here's where we are now, the red line. And this is, this is uh, energy production since 1850, plus human population growth since 1850. So you can see they, they track pretty well. And um, of course, this is 2050 is out here someplace. It's, Global population is supposed to level off at, um, you know, actually, I think this is kind of optimistic, right? I mean, it's 7 billion now, and it's probably headed to more than, more than 8 billion. Um, and energy growth has gone with that uh, historically. Um, this is, somebody calculated recently, this, this, pro this uh, under the graph here, the colored part probably represents about 200 million years worth of fossil fuel accumulation that's been burned in about 160 years. Um, so this, this is a huge thing. This is not just a huge thing ecologically. This is not just a huge thing culturally. This is a huge thing geologically. This is a huge thing in the history of the planet. And um, it's not going to go away. So th th that's, that's a lot of carbon that's been released. Um, nothing, not, not nearly as much as during the PTM, but people have started to, to try to calculate um, how long it takes to get all that carbon out. And um, this is a simulation of what happens if you have an instantaneous release of 5,000 billion tons of carbon into the atmosphere, um, it, it, and a series of model runs that show how fast that comes out. And it's marked off in, in years up to here, so 200, 400, 600, 1,000 years, and then in thousands of years uh, going in this direction up to 10,000 years. So this, there's a scale shift here. Um, but the, the, the take home point here is that all these models, which are, which are you know, they, they, they're different from one another, they all show that uh, if you dump a very large amount of, of carbon into the atmosphere, it takes thousands of years or tens of thousands of years to come out. So you know, half of it maybe comes out roughly in the first thousand years. Um, and then there's still 30, 40 percent of it left 10,000 years later. And it doesn't all come out for about 100,000 years or maybe 150,000 years, which is beginning to sound like the PETM, which, which is good, because it should sound like the PTM, because that, that would tell us that our, our models are working right. So the legacy of what we're doing now isn't just that it's important now. It's that it's important for tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of years into the future. That's what the kind of thing that makes people think, OK, maybe the Anthropocene is something real. And what about temperature? So here's a, a different model run, different set of authors. Um, 
different set of assumptions, carbon emissions of 7 billion tons a year. Well, last year it was about 10 billion tons, so we're already past that. Consumption increase of 2% per year, and you just burn up the whole fossil fuel reservoir. Um, and you get this steep rise in temperature. And then this was one of the first, this was just five years ago, um, one of the first simulations that actually ran out the simulation. Most of the simulations people do, they, they stop at 2100, because it's just like, who's thinking? You know, even, even the scientists weren't thinking about past 2100. I mean, that's, oh, that was 100 years away. Um, but you know, 1,000 years later, um, the temperature elevation is still the same. It just, it, these things, this, the Earth system has an enormous inertia in it. And if the temperature stays high for thousands of years, um, then there are effects on a lot of things that, um, that, you, that are sort of less expected. So everyone's heard a little bit about sea level rise. You know, so sea level's going to go up. Uh, we all know that. It's projected to be something like a meter of sea level rise by 2100. Uh, so the, the southern end of Manhattan might look more like this than like it does now with all these marshes here to trying to keep the sea at bay. Um, this, is, this is one I always try to use when I'm showing it this in Washington. This is, <laughs> this is, uh, this is plus seven and a half meters of sea level. Um, now, admittedly, this, is, this, is, this would be a projection for the year 5,000. Okay, so you know, 3,000 years from now, I'm sure the, Jeff the Jefferson Memorial will not be there, and, uh, and there'll be even more traffic than this on the... <laughs> On the 14th Street Bridge, but um, but you know, it's just just to give you a sense of that. I mean, we're we're talking about major changes to coastlines, and these are the kinds of changes that happen uh, when the temperature stays high for a long time. So this is this is losing the Greenland ice cap, but that's what you expect if you hold on to CO2 levels um, something like what we have now, or maybe uh, a bit higher than what we have now for. Um, a few thousand years, and that's what's going to happen if we put it in, it doesn't come out very fast. Um, so other signs that we live in the Anthropocene, you know, I've talked a lot about climate, I've talked now a little bit about sea level, but there are actually lots of things that, that tell us we're at a demarcation. Um, there's one of them is the, is the, the chemistry of the ocean. So here's, here, here this, is, this is CO2 in the atmosphere, this is, this is pH of the ocean. Um, it's going down at, uh, just as temperature is going up. So we're changing ocean chemistry. Um, this one is even in some ways more profound, it's less biological. Uh, here, here's the history of the planet in billions of years. And here's the number of mineral species. Uh, so rising slowly, uh, then kind of getting a little bit of a, a pickup as, as we get uh, life uh, uh, on the planet, and then uh, oxygen producing life. So photosynthesis is invented, and the number of minerals jumps up. That's like two and a half billion years ago. And then, and, oh, the next rise, it's now. <laughs> we're doing that. We're, we're increasing the number of mineral species on the planet, uh, producing all sorts of new minerals. Um, we're altering the nitrogen cycle. So this, this, is, uh, this is the amount of... Uh, fertilizer that's been produced since uh, 1900 about. And uh, this, is, um, this is how we feed ourselves. There wouldn't be seven billion people on this planet if uh, we weren't making synthetic nitrogen from the atmosphere and the energy in, in fossil fuels. If you, you could feel around on your own body, probably something like 50% of your proteins contain nitrogen that was fixed through the Haber-Bosch process. So you, you are a 50% syn human synthesis, um, or at least your proteins are. Uh, and of course, that's, that's led to a huge increase in, in the biomass of terrestrial vertebrates. Here we are. These are, these are wild vertebrates. This is us, 32% of terrestrial vertebrate biomass. And these are the animals that we eat, 65%. And we all know that we're also uh, generating a lot of extinctions. These are the big five mass extinctions from 
the paleontological record of the last uh, 540 million years. And here are some extinction uh, percentages, uh, very rough estimates. Uh, I don't vouch for these numbers exactly, but um, we're not yet at levels uh, that compete with, with geological extinctions, but there's certainly a significant pulse of extinction here. And the things that aren't going extinct, we're mixing around. So we're, we're sort of homogenizing um, the fauna and flora of the planet. These are just some places with um, substantial uh, numbers of invasive species, New Zealand. You know, a lot of these places on this list, they're, we're starting to sort of uh, see significant proportions of, of um, the fauna or flora are composed of species that are, that are introduced. Okay, so, and of course then there are really obvious things, like you can see what we're doing from space. Um, how does this help? I mean, a lot of people look at this and they, they, they think this is, this is kind of depressing. Um, and, and, you know, there, there is definitely a depressing aspect to it. There's a, there's a sadness, sadness that's associated with the loss of species, um, with the loss of, of, of things that we love, with uh, the loss of habitat. Um, but I think it's actually necessary to confront this and to realize that we have started the Anthropocene, that the things that we think are untrammeled nature are already trammeled by us. That the things that, that there's, nothing, there's no ecosystem on this planet that hasn't had the human fingerprint on it some way or another. Um, and that many of the things that we think are, are beautiful and natural are already, they're already, they've already been modified by our ancestors. They may not be in ways that are obvious to us. So um, in the introduction, uh, we were told about the sort of fruitless political debate. And I think this, this is uh, my, um, this is my uh, cartoon representation with, with uh, Al Gore being represented by a conservative cartoonist as uh, a religious figure, repent, reuse, recycle, lest ye burn, um, and a bunch of uh, raving environmentalists like me uh, praising the globe and you know, think that, thinking that natural ecosystems are more important than people. Um, and then uh, from the other side of the spectrum that the evil industrialists are, are really um, at fault here I have some sympathy to this point of view, but, but I, I think this is, this is actually the problem, is that, that um, people want to assign blame and they want to, um, they see this as, a, as a two opposing sides that can't possibly meet. And I think that what the Anthropocene perspective does is it, is it helps us recognize that with seven billion people on the planet and a thousands of years, tens of thousands of years long history already of modifying the planet, that it's really, it's kind of too late to think about putting anything back the way it was. So there, there's, there's a, a one side that you can sort of think of that you know, we need to make, we need to restore natural ecosystems. And I think that's an unattainable goal. Um, it's been unattainable for a long time. Things don't stay the same on this planet, and we are making them change really fast. Uh, and there's no way to avoid that. Um, on the other side, there's a kind of fear response, or um, I'm making money, or whatever the, whatever the cause for it that just says, don't bother me with this. I, I deny that there's any change happening. And so you, uh, if, if on one side you have people who want to do the impossible, which is put it back the way it was, and on the other side you have people who don't want to admit that there's anything going on at all because it's either not convenient or it's so scary that they can't recognize what's happening, then you have a real problem. And what I like about the Anthropocene perspective is it says things have changed, things have always changed. There's a lot of change that we don't like and we need to actually recognize how this system works. We need, to, we need to acknowledge that it has a lot of inertia, that the things that we do now will 
echo forward into the future for thousands or tens of thousands of years. We're living on a planet that is now kind of like our spaceship in that sort of early 70s analogy. We're living on a planet over which we have some control. We can't make it do anything, but we can make it do some things. And we need to let go of a, a kind of innocent um, and, and unrealistic desire to return to a pristine environment that's not influenced by us. And we also need to kick people in the rear if they, if they say that nothing's happening. It's, it's time to kind of put those two things together in a synthesis um, that leads us to, to make reasonable plans based on the science that we do understand of how things are changing for how we want them to be instead of um, uh, continuing a really unproductive fight about nothing's happening, I want it the way it was. I don't think either of those is going to happen. This is, a, this is a, um, an example maybe of, of a happy kind of future. It's a longleaf pine forest in southern Georgia um, that's been, it's, it's an absolutely lovely forest. It's moderately diverse for where it is. And it's been managed very carefully for um, something like 100 years with prescribed burns. So it's a very human landscape. The forester who manages this is a gardener on a very large scale. Um, but he's creating a habitat that has a fair, fairly high species diversity. So I think there is a route forward um, if we're willing to take it. So that's where I'm going to stop, and I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you, Scott. I think that was a um, brilliant introduction to uh, the series and a brilliant talk in its own right. You touched on a lot of the topics that are going to be coming up in the next six weeks in terms of fire, biotic movements, uh, lo the human fingerprint, which is very important. I think that's a perspective that I think will come up um, a couple of times. And that great slide of how many uh, domestic animals there are, which will be, in, I think, will figure prominently in our final talk. So as you know, we now have uh, 45 minutes for discussion. And so we do have a mic. And this is being recorded. And we did get a little bit of extra money from the university to try to put together 10, 15 minutes highlights. Did you know that? Now you know. You have to sign a waiver um, that, we'll, that we're hoping I haven't we can, signed yet. We, that, we, that we're hoping we can put together that we can send out to the schools so that this has a bit of a um, a bit of a legacy. So we, um, we won't film you guys, but just so you know, to, to use the mic in case we want to capture some of your answers, if that makes any sense. So please, any comments or questions? The floor is open. Ooh. Who's going first? Joan, is that are you? Uh, thanks. That was a very interesting talk, uh, Dr. Wing. I'm just wondering, you mentioned the various possible things that might have contributed to the, um, I guess we can call it a carbon burp, uh, that started the uh, PETM. And I'm wondering, you did talk about the methyl hydrates in the ocean floor. Uh, what, what is, is, is there a conceivable scenario that could lead to those melting today, uh, you know, is, is the increase in, in uh, ocean temperature likely to, or possibly going to lead to um, such a release in the present day? So the, so the question was whether the methyl hydrates, are there methyl hydrates now, and is it possible that they could give us a new carbon burp? Yeah. Um, there, there definitely are methane hydrates in the, in the ocean floor today, so there are deposits and they've actually been discussed as potential mining targets for energy companies. So, you know, we may not have to wait for them to dissociate. We might, we might go get them before that happens. Um, it is the the latest modeling I've seen on this suggests that it would actually be pretty difficult to release them today. The ocean is much colder than it was uh, at the time of the Paleocene Eocene thermal maximum, and the stability of those deposits is a function both of pressure and, and temperature. So colder temperatures, they're 
more stable, and it's, it may be difficult to heat the bottom of the ocean enough to, um, to cause a methane release from that source, a, a very large one at least. Um, but there are other methane uh, reservoirs in permafrost um, and on land that could be much more vulnerable than, than the deep sea um, methane hydrates. Thanks. Did you want to ask a question? Um, I'm just wondering with the rate that temperatures and climate was changing in the past, tens of thousands of years ago, and how plants and animals were able to adapt and relocate during those changes, how can that compare to the rate that we are creating, the rate of change that we are creating today, how can nature keep up with that in the way that it naturally selects and adapts? Mm -hmm. Right, so you probably all heard that. So can nature keep up with the rate of change today, given what you know about how it changed before? Well, that's, th this question of rates is, is obviously a really critical one. And um, it's one of the reasons why we're, we're working hard to try to understand how long the onset of this of this PETM event was. If it was, if it happened in um, a couple of thousand years or three or four thousand years, um, that's still really fast, although probably ten times slower than the rate at which humans are changing things. Um, but it's fast enough that you might expect it to be difficult for plant species or even animal species to, to disperse long distances. So in that case, it, it actually might have more, um, it might be more parallel to what we're doing than we had thought. There was a time maybe 10 years ago when a lot of people thought that the onset might have been more like 20,000 years, in which case it's really so much slower that, um, that the processes uh, by which the fauna and flora could adjust to the new climate would be very different. Um, so exactly how parallel this is, we don't know yet. We don't know how fast the onset was. Um, there was a paper that came out last fall that suggested it took 13 years. I think that that paper is almost certainly wrong, but it did get published. So, um, uh, the, But I, I mean, I think the best answer to the question is that this, this is probably a best case scenario. So some extinction, a lot of range change, and a huge amount of local extirpation of populations is a best case scenario. Uh, and I, so I think it's, it's almost certainly going to be worse than that. Um, it's interesting, I've seen a fair amount of work recently on, on, um, on evolutionary change in response to very rapid climate change. And I think that's one, one area where we may be surprised that, that when you have really high selection for um, for variants in a population that evolution can proceed pretty rapidly and it, it may be that the rate of evolutionary changes can be more like the rate of, of ecological adjustment than I think most people kind of would have thought. But I still think it's, it's almost certainly gonna be much worse than the PETM. So I think that if I can just put in my two cents worth, I think that's an area of active research to that question about how fast, how fast can it go? given if, how fast can a population change. Yeah, that's, that's I, I, should, I should have no, played it really later. <laughs> but that's, that's where some of the smart money is, actually. OK, I hope this is a coherent question. Thank you for <laughs> dropping things. Um, well, I hope it's a coherent answer. <laughs> <laughs> so in the, sort of as like a piggyback question on the previous question, um, in the face of this rapid climate change and this possibly just as rapid evolution, will there be a principled way we can go about conservation efforts for species that might possibly go extinct or might possibly be able to adapt to such um, rapid climate change? Um, is there a coherent way 
to plan, to conserve as much as we can in the face of rapid climate change? Is that, Is that a good idea? Yeah, well, I think, I think it's a, a great idea. Uh, <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I, I am, th this realism thing, I, I have trouble with realism myself. You know, I, 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 f I feel bad when I say, yeah, there's, we're gonna lose a bunch of stuff. Um, but, but actually, Arna is the one who introduced me to the, this idea of, um, of prioritizing, you know, at, you, at least as one factor in uh, prioritiz prioritizing effort for conservation, you should think about the evolutionary distinctiveness of, of, of the species that might, you might lose. You should also think about their ecological role and, and a lot of other things. Um, so, I, yeah, I think that this is all part of, it's all part of running a planet. Is 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 doing the science that then informs the policy, and I I have a huge amount of faith in the ability of societies, not so much in the ability of individuals, but the the ability of societies to in, to entrain new customs and new new um, <coughs> kind of moral standards and to, to put those in effect. I mean, we, that happens all the time, and you see you see amazing changes in in social mores over relatively brief spans of years. And so I think if, if we can do that on you know, gay marriage or slavery or you know, name your, your topic, um, it seems like it should be possible to do it. And, th and that's actually kind of why I want to pull back on the doom and gloom scenarios, because I think what happens when you, when you emphasize the, the loss, you know, the, which, which is real, you know, when you emphasize that, you just bum people out. <laughs> you know, you make them so sad or so scared that they, they either say, I can't deal with this, or they say, I don't believe you. And that's the last thing you want them to do. You want to pull them in and say, you know, we're adults, right? This is not, <laughs> this is not, not you know, non-productive behavior is a bad idea. We can't afford it. We need to, we need to, develop new customs. So I would say that that's the science of the future in a lot of ways is, is figuring out how to have a strategy. So can I make one, yeah, <coughs> can I make one comment on that? Because that's a, just before I go on, sorry. This is really close to my heart. But one of the issues with that question is that there is this, can we just get it back to where it was camp? And I think that when you made that distinction, that's really important because there are a lot of people who really fight against Strategic, it's called strategic conservation planning. They're like, no, we need to save everything everywhere. Yeah. And they mean it. And you're, so I think you're, you're, yeah. you're giving us a different story that I think is really important, so it's a good question. I'm just wondering what brought the carbon dioxide down and what ended the PETM? <laughs> so yeah. the question is, what ended the PETM? Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's probably a combination of factors. Um, and it looks as if um, that it, it looks as if photosynthesis is the first thing that probably cuts in. So you, you need, what basically what happens is plants come to the rescue and pull um, quite a lot of that carbon out of the atmosphere. And um, that the reason we think that's the case is because the, the, cha the, the um, carbon isotope ratio changes out ahead of apparently other things. So it looks as if the drawdown is, is um, mostly, whatever's doing the drawdown prefers carbon-12 quite a bit to carbon-13. So it, that would make sense if it were, if it were plants. Um, but that's not all of it. And um, the reason that there's such a long tail on the isotope curve and the, the reason there's such a long tail on the models of the future, there's such a, a long period where there's a residuum of you know, maybe it's 10%, maybe it's 30% of the original uh, CO2 release that sort of hangs in the atmosphere is because the rest of it gets taken out by weathering. And that's a much slower process. And that's what it, ultimately, when it all gets back to equilibrium, um, it's been used up in weathering reactions in soils and goes out in water to the ocean and gets you get de deposition of carbonate. And there's actually evidence at the end of the PETM that there's a big increase in carbonate productivity in the ocean, or carbonate preservation in the ocean. So 
it looks as if that's also a part of the part of the picture, but it but that's um, there's, a, there's a longer period there. Over here. So, and hi Scott. Um, hi. In relation to that, what uh, would you mind commenting or speculating on the effect of the fact that we are currently in an interglacial and have experienced recent glaciations and the perhaps if we have an equivalent different analog in the geologic time scale in deep time, maybe besides the PETM if there was not ice? So the question is, give, how do we use the PETM as an, as an analog given that we're in an interglacial? Yeah. It's a very particular yeah. time, the Holocene. So yeah. could you? For, the first thing is for, former students are not allowed to ask questions. <laughs> <laughs> They're too hard. We planted her. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, the, uh, so that's a very good point. Um, the, uh, that we are, you know, we're probably, a lot of people think we're basically canceling the next glaciation, the next glacial max. So, is, so that, is, that, is, that, is that possible? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and in fact, the, the guy who did, does the, who did those, the carbon models, Dave Archer at University of Chicago, he, he would argue it was, it was always the, you may have heard that the, um, the ice ages, the recent ice ages are, um, their sort of pace is set by changes in the orbital configuration of, of the Earth. And um, the next glaciation was kind of a little bit weak anyway, and uh, the addition of this much CO2 to the atmosphere is, is it's, it looks like it really could cancel it out, essentially. So, so we, might, we might skip um, a, a glacial. Um, and I think that because we're in, we were, we're in a glacial, we still, we still have ice caps in Antarctica and on Greenland, their feedbacks between ice and the albedo of the earth. So, you know, as you melt ice, you expose darker, <clears throat> excuse me, you expose darker surfaces, and uh, the, um, the result is that you uh, warm the planet more. And so that's a feedback that wasn't present at the time of the PETM. There, was, there were no ice caps, as far as we know, anywhere. And the result is that, that um, it's quite possible the change will happen even faster now than it would have then because there's the ice albedo feedback. Um, so I think that there's, oh, thanks. Um, it, it, it would, it would, I would guess that on average, this means that, that the pace of change is likely to be faster now than it was then. And yet, another, I mean, the forcing is faster because we're faster, but also um, the ice albedo, ice albedo feedback. Um, there was something I was, oh, um, there's a, a cool book um, called Deep Future written by a guy named Kurt Stager who's a, um, a paleoecologist. And uh, in, in it he suggests that, that fossil fuel deposits are incredibly valuable as climate manipulation tools. And that if we were really thoughtful, we'd be hanging on to, all, to our fossil fuels uh, <laughs> to make sure that we can also skip the next glacial after this one. <laughs> so sort of, you know, this is really valuable stuff. If you need to, if you need to, uh, to, to halt a, gl a, a glacial epoch, you just, you just light off a bunch of coal seams and you're good to go for another 20,000 years. So can we just say this, that so your point is slightly count counterintuitive in that because we're an interglacial, yeah. The, low, the current warming may be, the current forcing may be even worse, well, it's, not it's better be, because yeah. of the albedo. Yeah. It's, it's because, yeah, I mean, even though we're in an interglacial, there's still ice caps, which is, the, I guess, the point. There were no ice caps at the time of the PETM. Yeah. Um, if I may, uh, just to uh, take, uh, I'm sure at the, ba at the start of your talk, uh, the data was on the graph, but to relate it now to what you're talking about, um, what was the CO2 concentration level? Uh, just before the PETM, just to get in, in comparison to where we are now or where we were 100 years ago. We, we don't know what the, what the, oh, I'm sorry, yes, go oh, ahead. Sorry, so the question is, what was the CO2 level just before the PETM on, onset? Yes. Where did we start from be, and just before the... some sense of comparison with where we are now. I, th I thought I'd left those slides at the end of my presentation. <laughs> I was hoping somebody would ask that question, but I've, I, the, the file was big, so I took them out. Um, 
we don't know very well what the, what the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere was before, and there's, there's a lot of argument about it. We're actually working right now on, um, on trying to um, develop a new record of CO2. So I said there wasn't any ice. Um, and there are four or five different methods of trying to reconstruct CO2 for times before ice. And uh, everybody who has a method thinks everybody else's method is terrible. <laughs> so it's at that point of, you know, where we really, we really disagree, there's a lot of disagreement. Um, the method that I am working with, and but which I have not a great deal of confidence in, um, uses um, the, it uses the pores on leaves. So we have fossil leaves, and um, as you probably know, um, there are these pores all over the surface of the leaf that allow CO2 in, but they also allow water vapor out. So <clears throat> most plants have to kind of tune how many pores they make so that they get the best cost benefit. So they, they get the most CO2 in, which is how they make their food, and they lose the least water um, so they don't have to worry so much about drying out. If CO2 is higher, you would expect them to find a balance with fewer pores. If CO2 is lower, they need more pores um, because they just need it to get the, enough CO2 in to make their food. So we use, and they're fossils that preserve the, the cuticle, the waxy covering of leaves, and you can count the number of stomata on the cuticle, and I really wish I had brought, um, actually, I did bring, I brought a show and tell. Um, so this, this, is a, uh, this is a bag, a baggie of um, 56.1 million year old uh, ginkgo leaf cuticle. And you're welcome to come up and look at it afterwards, but it, it looks like a bunch of pieces of brown wax paper or something in the bag. Um, and so, so those, are, those preserve pretty well. And you can count the stomata. And um, you, need to, you need a reference set from the modern. So you, you look at modern ginkgos. And you um, develop a relationship between the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over the last couple, couple hundred years when it's increased quite a bit. And you say, OK, so with each 10 parts per million increase in CO2, you get this many fewer stomata, or uh, pores on the leaf. And then you take that to the 56 million years ago. And if you do that, the answer is that um, right before the PETM, the, um, the, the partial, the, the CO2 in the atmosphere went from about um, 380 or 400 parts per million to maybe about um, 800 parts per million. But that's before the PTM starts. And then if you, um, and that's associated with a warming, a slower warming. And then that suggests that, a, it, it, so it about doubles. And a doubling of CO2 at that point appears to be associated with about a four degree Celsius increase in global temperature. And at the PETM, it, it basically goes up another four to eight degrees Celsius, so it might double or more than, slightly more than double again, is what we would guess. So it might, it might start off at something like what it is right now, go up to about 800, and then go up to maybe 1,600 or 2,000 parts per million, which is at the very high end of well, you know, that's what happens if you burn up every, all the fossil fuels. Um, it ends up in that territory. So it actually could be that the, the levels are very, are very comparable. The, the question then is, how come the climate, the background climate, was so different from today's if the CO2 level is similar to now? And you know, one possibility is if you hold the CO2 at 400, maybe you know, amazing things that we don't really understand fully would happen if you held it that way for 100,000 years. Thank you. Now we have this question here. Um, how would uh, um, climate change and uh, um, the polar ice caps melting change um, aquatic life? 
So did everyone hear that? So if, if we're doing these projections, what's going to happen in the sea or in water? Uh, <clears throat> that's another one of those hard questions that I don't know the answer to. I don't, I, <clears throat> obviously, if, if the climate gets warmer, then the surface ocean also warms up. Um, and uh, for some organisms, even more important is this change in, in pH so that you make the ocean more acidic and it dissolves. If you're an organism that makes shells um, out of calcium carbonate, it's much harder to make the shells. And at some point, it gets so hard you can't make your shell anymore. But um, this is an area that's been, I know, I don't follow it really closely, but it's been uh, a very active area of research in the last 10, 10 years or so. And it turns out that different kinds of marine organisms respond very differently to this change in pH. So some of them are extremely sensitive and others are, uh, don't seem to be that much affected by it. So I, I think it's, um, it's, it's likely to lead to really major changes in marine ecosystems just as it does in, in the ones on land, but um, I, I know less about that. And, and that's an area where we get, um, yeah. there's a lot of active research on how quickly organisms can adapt, so how quickly can evolution happen because of this, yeah. we're seeing these differences. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll ask it. It's kind of somewhat a silly question. Um, if President Obama gave you one-tenth of the defense budget in the State of the Union <laughs> next year to um, do something sensible with plants and with carbon, how would you spend the money? So, because we don't, round I, I like this question, by the way. <laughs> I want everybody to hear this question. So, the Smithsonian... <laughs> Scott Wing gets one-tenth of the defense budget, which is, I don't know, a lot of money, <laughs> right? Yeah. And says, do something with plants to save the planet. What yeah. would you do? Sorry, do something sensible. Do something sensible. <laughs> yeah, that's, 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 actually, that's actually easier than doing something with plants to save the planet. Um, I, would, I, would, uh, I would tell him I would make him money on a... Uh, $35 a ton carbon tax <laughs> and give it all back <laughs> if I could have you know, a tiny percent of the carbon tax. I think, I think we, we have to, I mean, the first and most important thing that we need to do, and, and I am now not speaking as an uh, uh, employee of, of uh, anybody in particular. I'm expressing my personal opinion, um, and I want to make that perfectly clear <laughs> uh, to anyone who might ever hear this. Um, but I think, I, think we need, I think we need a system of some sort where um, that fully accounts for the cost of, of burning fossil fuels. And part of the cost of burning fossil fuels are the effects that they will have once they're in the atmosphere. And so um, just like a lot of things, it makes sense to um, put a tax on it or do some sort of cap and trade or whatever the most effective political mechanism is. But the, you know, there's a huge problem, there's a huge political problem there in that it, it has to be done worldwide. You, know, you, can't, this is not some, you can't solve this problem in one country. Um, you can only solve it with pretty high participation from countries around the world. So. The question wasn't yeah. what, oh. how would you raise money, it was how would you spend it? Um, <laughs> I would spend it, on, would you spend it on? I would spend it on lobbying for the, <laughs> for, for raising the Once money. Once you got that carbon tax, what would you do with the money? Well, I don't, I don't actually really care too much what's <laughs> done with the money. I mean, I would love to have it you know, fund research, which that's, that would be a very appropriate use for it. But, um, but I think just having a carbon tax or having a price for carbon um, would mean that people would want to use less of they would want to use less fossil fuel because it would be more expensive to do so. And I think that would be a really, that would have a pretty powerful effect if it could be done globally. So can I ask just a follow up? Um, could we plant enough plants to pull carbon out of the atmosphere? I don't think so. Okay. It do, I mean, it, it doesn't, um, I don't think you can increase, it, 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 you can keep things from getting worse as fast. 
Right. So you, you, can, you, can, you can lose ground less rapidly by, by planting, by, by retaining the forests that we have, and perhaps by increasing forests. But the, the problem is that the, that the terrestrial biosphere doesn't have enough carbon in it so that it, it could really um, substantially counteract for over a very long period of time the amount of carbon that we could potentially put in the atmosphere. There just isn't the capacity to put Yeah, it, it doesn't have the capacity. Um, how would aquatic and semi-aquatic um, reptiles do um, in the future? Because um, like so the question is, how would reptiles, especially the ones that live in water, do? Are reptiles different from mammals and uh, other animals with respect to carbon? Wow. I, don't, I really don't know the answer to that question. You've completely stumped me. I can't even make anything up for you. <laughs> <laughs> He's a botanist, remember? Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> you have, sorry? So this, I, I, do you have do you have a comment? So, the, so the, the observation, and I think it goes back to the dinosaurs, is that when it's warmer, do reptiles get bigger? Right. Can you answer that, or should we open it up to the floor? Does anyone? I, I actually know a little bit about that. So there, there was one of the slides that was yeah. on for the um, the, the warm up was a, a slide of of uh, snake vertebra, and you may have, but the titan, oh, you know about Titanoboa. So, uh, Titanoboa is a um, a large snake from uh, Colombia, from the Paleocene, so just before the PETM. And uh, it, is, uh, it has vertebrae like this. And uh, it's reconstructed as having been something like 13 meters long or 14 meters long. It's, it's a very big snake. And uh, it's, it was, it was, the people who described it said that, that it, one reason it's very large is that it was very warm and that there's a correlation between body size in reptiles and temperature. And I, have, I, I think that's true. I, I also think there are probably a lot of other factors that, that affect the body size of organisms, and including snakes. So I, I guess it's, it's a possibility you know, on a warmer planet. Yeah. Especially if um, it has a lot of food services. Yeah, yeah if it has that's plenty right. to eat. It's productivity. And nobody eats it. <laughs> There's a question here at the back, up there. Yeah, please. Yeah, you, you mentioned that the glacial cycles uh, during the Pleistocene have been driven by the Earth's orbit in various ways. Um, but I wonder if you step back from that and you look at a much larger time frame, your, your 50 million year time frame, do we have any idea why the Pleistocene has, on average, been so much colder than the Paleocene and the Eocene? What, what's the difference? Right, so yeah. just to, so, the general trend we have this is a general cooling trend over the last 40 million years. Is that right? And so do we more. know why, yeah. even more, do yeah. we know why the, before we came along, the Earth was slowly getting cooler? The, the, the short answer is that most people think that carbon dioxide has a lot to do with it. So even on, on 100 million year time scales, there appears to be a correlation between really warm times in Earth history and times when, by various ways, the CO2 levels are, con are reconstructed to have been high. Um, and there are a number of lines of evidence that several of the major sort of nick points where global temperature drops in the last uh, 45, 50 million years are associated with decreases in, in, uh, in CO2 in the atmosphere. So um, there, it's not the only thing that's happening, but, um, but yeah, that's all right. Uh, but uh, but it, it appears that, it appears that. Sorry, can you repeat that? Do we know what drove those changes Oh, right. So, right, so if CO2 is, is causing all, also causing these long-term fluctuations, do we know what's causing the fluctuations in CO2? 
Um, they are uh, sometimes, some of them are related to uh, the rate at which carbon is being buried. Um, so they're, they're large scale tectonic, you know, plate tectonics, pl continents moving around, um, what's being subducted, um, whether mountain ranges are being uplifted on a long time scale is really important because if you uplift the Himalayan uh, uplift, a huge mountain range like that, you increase weathering rates over a very large area, and that actually sucks CO2 out of the atmosphere. If you subduct in a trench like the trench you know, off the coast um, of North America, off the west coast, if you subduct uh, carbonate-rich rocks, so you've, if you've had a shallow sea there for millions and millions of years and you start subducting that carbonate-rich rock, it, it blows CO2 out of the volcano. So things, factors like that, geological factors, um, have, a, have a huge influence on really long-term um, um, changes in, in how much CO2 is in the atmosphere. So we have a question right at the back here. So Hi, we have yeah. One or two more, yep. Um, so your, your point about uh, the fact that climates change over the long sweep of time is, is well taken, and, but I'm, I'm going to be kind of, I don't know, human-centric here for a minute, and I'm, I'm wondering... Over the last, uh, you know, over the long sweep of time, climates have changed, but humans haven't really been here over the long sweep of time either. And human civilization in particular has only thrived and, and human agriculture has only thrived in this last hmm, 10,000 years, uh, mainly due to this incredible climate stability that we've all been loving so much. So I'm just wondering if the, the, the take home that you're, you're putting forward here is that it's time for us to kiss that climate stability goodbye or if uh, what what your uh, what what is it you're you're suggesting that we have to anticipate now? So so I if so I if I can just oh, yeah. if I can just yeah. paraphrase that again, um, the point is that we our civilization um, has developed in a period of relative stability in the climate, and is there a projection that that stability will will in, what did you say? Can we kiss that stability goodbye? Yeah. So I, I, there's, it's pretty clear that the last five to eight thousand years has been relatively stable by, by Pleistocene standards, um, and that that's been probably a pretty good thing for the development of civilization. So and so I, I agree with you on that. Um, I think that it would be silly to lose any more of that stability than we have to lose. Um, I also am not very worried about the survival of the human species. I think if you're on your, if you're, you know, at seven billion and going up fast, it, it probably. I, you know, I'm, I'm actually a pretty big believer in technology, and I think uh, it creates all these problems and that we're not very smart about anticipating the problems that it will create before they come along. So I think there's a problem with, with that. But I also think that, that we have learned a lot about how to buffer ourselves in a very powerful way from, from changes. So I, don't, I think uh, human misery is a big problem. And, and uh, distribution of income is a huge problem. And people who don't have resources suffer mightily when other people probably won't suffer so much from the kinds of disruptions that are anticipated. So I think you know, the burden falls really unevenly, and, and that creates its own problems. But um, I, I worry about uh, following a kind of apocalyptic line here, because I actually don't think it's very realistic to, to you know, to talk about, you know, people sometimes say, well, I guess we're, we're screwed. I mean, the human race is going to go extinct because of our own climate change. And I actually, I, I don't think there's really any um, scientific justification for, for that kind of really fearful um, picture. I, I, but I completely take your point and agree with you that, that um, the instability that we're likely to cause is going to be a really bad thing for a lot of people. 
Any last? Yes, sir. Yeah, I was wondering if you don't think uh, it's Just conceivable. Well. You don't think it's conceivable to uh, have enough plants that will extract enough carbon to affect the inertia of this, this problem. Do you think a technological solution might be possible, like a, a geoengineering solution? Is, that... so is there a technological fix to this? Yeah. So th this gets into geoengineering, which is a really um, appropriately <laughs> hot topic. Um, I wasn't even thinking about that pun when I made it. <laughs> um, so, well, we're, we're already geoengineering. We just don't know it, or we haven't admitted it to ourselves that that's what we're doing. Um, so, I, I don't think it's it's something that we that we should not contemplate. But I think it's it's really. The, the real problems with geoengineering are, A, I don't think we know enough. Uh, I, th I think that it's kind of like, you know, if someone says um, you, uh, you're at risk of a heart attack and um, you could take this drug and that drug has these side effects and then you'll need to take these other drugs to counteract the side effects of the first drug, or you could eat a healthy diet and exercise, you know, sort of, and, you know, a lot of people, I think, choose the, <laughs> the first path of, <laughs> you know, oh, well, we'll you know, plug that hole and then have to plug the hole that gets, you know. But um, so, so I think, uh, you know, to me, the most sensible thing is to emit less carbon and to try to draw that down as fast as we can. And if you can find, uh, because then you, then you basically stem a big, you know, chunk of that problem, the climate change problem and the and the ocean acidification problem, you stem it at the source, um, and you know that's going to work. And, you, and it probably isn't going to have a lot of side effects because you're, you're basically uh, going, returning to sort of known territory, if you will. Um, so I think that is really the, the safest and surest thing to do. Um, but, um, you know, if, if we can't get the social political thing together, I think it's conceivable people will have to think about that. I, I, don't, I mean, I, we just don't know, I certainly don't know enough about the consequences to be able to, to say whether that's a, a good idea. I, I, to me, it makes much more sense to, to work on, the, on the, the cause instead of trying to put patches which may create their own problems. But it would have been nice if some of the, some of the um, paleoecology Data gave us an insight about what we could do, but the, 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 but the inertia is such yeah. that we don't. Yeah. Well, te have technologically, that. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, I don't, like it's that, an analog. Yeah, yeah, I think that that's. Yeah. Okay, so it is ten to, and I think um, we should probably stop there. Uh, I want to draw people's attention before I thank Scott. Uh, draw everyone's attention to what's coming up. So uh, Bruce Archibald will be um, next week talking about global biodiversity uh, and climate and what fossil insects as opposed to what fossil plants can tell us about how things have moved around um, and what uh, lessons we can draw. I'd like to, I'm not going to go through all of them, but the, the question about the stability, climate stability and, and human civilization, um, Anthony Barnofsky, uh, who is the final speaker um, in this series, I am sure will be talking about that because he's very interested in that inter intersection between stability and um, human culture and Apocalypse, And so I think we should keep in mind what Scott said about whether we should have an apocalyptic view or not and bring that up on the final evening. Um, Scott is <clears throat> in the middle of putting together uh, a brand, the, completely revamping the Smithsonian Institute's um, History of the World exhibit, which happens once in a generation. So this has been consuming him. And some of these ideas that he's given to you are going to be in that exhibit. And maybe some of the ideas that you gave to him may somehow make its way into this fairly, I think it's a 10 year project to completely change how the Smithsonian presents how the world, the world history um, to the seven, how many people go through there every year? Eight million last year. Eight million people a year. So this is a serious responsibility. So we're very happy that he could come. Give this inaugural talk. Please join me in thanking him for a very thoughtful presentation. <laughs>